Thanks, Doug. This is uh, really a privilege for me to be here, Buzz. Um, well, I'm very honored to be here myself. Uh, your name has come up so many times uh, and um, from so many different people. I think when you get Art Jensen and Bob Sternberg to agree on something, you know you really have something. And uh, both of them uh, strongly encourage the board to uh, consider you for this interview, and I'm delighted. I'm very flattered. Okay. Well, to start this off, I'd like to just ask you, how did your interest in psychology and intelligence begin? Well, my interest in um, psychology was piqued when I had a chance to work uh, with uh, Donald Taylor at, as an undergraduate at Stanford. Taylor, who later became the Dean of Industrial Administration and then graduate dean at Yale, uh, was interested both in problem solving and in the applications in the workforce and that, and you know, how things actually happen. And that really kept my interest going on. Then right after Stanford, I had to pay a debt to society uh, because the NROCC had paid my way through college. And uh, so in my, uh, during my military service, I saw a lot of cases where uh, some people did things very well, some people did things very poorly, and you couldn't always predict who would do which. Uh, that got me interested. Then uh, I went back to Yale and uh, was able to get right in on the computer revolution. I arrived the same day as Yale's first computer. And that made it possible to study formal models of cognition of complicated uh, thought using, um, using computer models. That was fascinating. Then the final thing was when I went to, uh, to, uh, to UCLA on a uh, research associateship for a while, I had the opportunity to work with uh, Jakob Marshak, an economist who set a model for the use of formal thinking that I'm still trying to live up to. Okay, so. interesting. Uh, and I, I wanted to ask you too, in the 50s and 60s, the, the computer was uh, thought of as a metaphor for the mind. Uh, do, you, do you still think that's valid? And Whatever happened to the computer metaphor, <laughs> right? Well. For one thing, it is so, uh, it's a little bit like Freud's uh, ideas. It is so incorporated into our everyday thinking, concepts of information processing, of different levels of storage, such that we have actually forgotten where it came from. So that uh, a great deal of the computer metaphor uh, has carried forward to this day, and it, we just don't recognize it as such, which is sort of a model of success. Uh, the details of talking about computers uh, have dropped out, I think, for um, a little bit for two reasons. One is honorable and one is dishonorable. Uh, the honorable one is that uh, with the tremendous increase in our knowledge of biology and of the biology of the brain, there's come to be less uh, need for a metaphor. Although I point out that a, a connectionist model is every bit as much a computer model as it is a brain model. Uh, the, that's the honorable reason. The unfortunate reason is that uh, some people thought that talking about computers implied that we were saying that the physical model of the brain was analogous to the physical construction of a computer uh, with precision, high-speed computation. That never was true and it was just a misunderstanding. Then there's a dishonorable reason. Sometime along about 1980, there was a perceived a great need to invent new jargon so that the funding agencies could say that they were funding people at the yeah. cutting edge. Yeah. And so we had to say something else. Today, we do it by saying neural and then going on with whatever we're doing. So the, the cognitive models of the 70s and 80s then, what, what happened to them? They are so incorporated into our thinking about thought. For example, I published a paper in the early 70s that talked about three stages of memory, a short-term uh, reflection, a uh, sort of what we say today was working memory, and the long-term store. That was done in a uh, out of a computer orientation completely. And what's happened is we use the language and we forget where it came from which, as I say, is a mark of success. 
stepping back a little and thinking about when this computer metaphor developed um, in the 50s, uh, Kronbach published a, a very important piece, his presidential address to APA actually, on the two disciplines of scientific psychology uh, that's been easier to talk about than do. Uh, why do you think it's been so hard to combine the two disciplines? Well, why is it so hard to combine the two disciplines? Uh, first, I think that we tend to focus on the uh, failure a little bit just for the same reason that the newspaper never talks about the thousands of people who did not get into a traffic accident yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, the, um, there has been a great deal of uh, union, if you will. The talk we just heard by Nibauer was shot through with uh, discussions and concepts for information processing psychology and uh, from experimental psychology. The ideas of uh, control of attention and of focusing uh, have uh, been all come from uh, experimental psychology and are routinely used in differential psychology today. On the other side of the fact, when we started out this, uh, work in about 1970, individual differences with the error variance. And that was it, and nothing else was talked about. Now there is a great deal of discussion within the experimental psychology journals about uh, differential uh, effects on different people, about backgrounds, uh, expert novice studies, uh, male female studies. So I think that there's been a great deal of marriage of the two. And we, again, forget how much success there's been. On the other hand, there is a couple of real problems in getting them together. And it has to do with the way you go about business. The differential psychologists, not 100%, these are all views, but the mm -hmm. differential psychologists, uh, in general, take a test or a battery of tests, which means you get a lot of rather shallow information from each individual. And it's cheap to get that, inform uh, that information. It's uh, relatively cheap to give a test compared to uh, having a person come into the lab two or three times over a period to get them trained and then to do the task. Uh, as a result, the differential psychologist can go out into the world and can get a little bit of information from a lot of people out there in the world and draw correlations. The um, experimental psychologist is trained to look very precisely with a lot of concern about theoretical models and perhaps to invent tasks to test the models and evaluate the models. Now the result of all of this is that the uh, differential psychologist is in, a good is in good shape to talk about what I call first order empirical generalizations. But they have a lot of problems with developing causal models because they just simply don't have the controls they need. The, the experimental psychologist is exactly the opposite. They've got very good data. They set up things for good tests of causal models. But then you wind up, what are they causal models of? Generalizing uh, beyond the laboratory becomes much more difficult. What, what models today do you value the most? Do you think will have the most longevity? Oh, which models will have the most longevity? Mm. Well, uh, the temptation to be flip and say, let's see who spawned the most models because they should have the greatest reproductive success. <laughs> but but uh, I don't think that's what's going to happen. Uh, I think, first of all, you don't want to imply that there should be just one model for all purposes. That uh, if you are going to talk about the causes of individual differences in mental competence, and especially the biological causes, which is a very important topic. Then you want to look to, to models of uh, cognitive competence that mate well with the uh, models, with uh, our knowledge of the brain and biology. For example, uh, the idea that there would be general processes that come up leads you to have a look for a G. The fact that there are separate organizations for visual and spatial uh, processes and the fact that the forebrain is very much involved in a lot of different activities leads you to look at models that emphasize attention, that model uh, visual and spatial, uh, I'm sorry, verbal and, and uh, spatial problem solving. So that the verbal, spatial, 
model has a lot to be said for it if you are going down the reductionist uh, mode. Now, if you are going to the question of how does mental competence get used and what are the effects of individual differences in mental competence in life, in school, and in the workforce, then I think that the fluid intelligence, crystallized intelligence model has a lot to be said for it, for asking whether or not people are trying to solve problems by figuring out the answer anew or whether they are remembering and going by analogy to, what they've, to something they've experienced previously. So I think that what you have the model for depends a little bit on what you do. Mm -hmm. I point out that physics is, has done that for a long time, that uh, nobody proposes to have a string theory of automotive mechanics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you view as some of the most important developments in intelligence research? Or the most important developments, well, let's, starting with Galton, let's, let's, let's <laughs> say that Galton <laughs> and Binet have been here, mm -hmm. all right, and, and, and they started the field. I mean, you, you'd have to, to, to give them credit, although conceptually, uh, Juan Huerta de San Juan, back in the 1600s, yeah. has a good deal to be said yeah. for his ideas. Uh, I think that, um, first of all, psychometrics has got to have had tremendous influence, the development of psychometric models, starting with Spearman and going right through to Jorskog and, and uh, Bentler and uh, the uh, causal modelers, has had a tremendous influence, l and very largely for the good. If I snipe at them, you want to remember that there's a tremendous thing they've done. Mm -hmm. There has been one unfortunate side effect of this, and this has been the identification of intelligence in the sense of individual differences in mental competence with the IQ test and sort of saying that de facto what we're trying to do is explain the variance in the IQ test. I think that that's been a side effect, but on the whole, psychometrics have been extremely important. The second thing, which uh, is coming forward just now, is our tremendous advance in biology, in imaging techniques, the Human Genome Project, uh, understanding molecular genetics, we've heard uh, earlier today, mm -hmm. that we're actually going to get through to the pathways and stop saying, oh, this is, it's this or that uh, level of uh, heritability, to saying this is the gene, this is the process, this is what's doing, it's going to affect uh, this particular ability, say, when I would say his attention. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be at all surprised if someday we understand the molecular basis of how people control attention. Interesting. Well, as you once said that um, in most areas of research, uh, investigators stand on the shoulders of their predecessors, but in psychology, we stand on their face. Um, <laughs> what, what can we do about this? Uh, well, first, so that I'm not accused of standing on, my, on <laughs> anybody's face, uh, that was a um, quote from, uh, that was quote was brought to my attention by my late colleague, Bob Bowles. And uh, that we do, though, we have tended to uh, try to shoot down the people who went before us. Mm -hmm. And I think there are um, two reasons. First of all, you're asking me to be a metapsychologist. You're asking me to talk about the psychology of psychologists. Uh, I think there are two reasons. I don't think that it's a trade. I think it's a state. I think that there's hyper-competitiveness -com in the field. Uh, because we've developed a tradition that it's a little cottage industry and everybody must have their own model. Uh, rather than the more mature sciences, there are some theories, and then there would be more agreement on what the issues were. Now, as we get into more agreement about what the key issues are, and I see that developing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we are going to have less need to invent theories, and I hope to invent jargon. Not, uh, I will, what, uh, not give names to protect the guilty. But I'm not thinking of just one person when I say that a lot of our current hot theories, highly publicized theories, are simply repackaging of old ideas in new jargon. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see less of that. And the other thing is not social. I think that there, one of the reasons for this has been that we have overvalued the Kuhnian ideas about need to have a revolution in science. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants to be the revolutionary. 
and we've undervalued the importance of just solid progress toward a topic. And I mean solid, good research on a topic that goes forward. And then there's a little fact, which may be that the granting agencies, again, are yeah. in there trying to show yeah. that they're at the cutting edge, so they've got mm -hmm. to have a new name. Mm -hmm. Or use the latest methodology, whether it's relevant or not. Uh, they don't need, uh, yeah, they use the latest methodology, whether it's relevant or not, but sometimes I think the latest jargon is more important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Buzz, what do you, what do you consider your, your greatest contributions? Oh, well, my greatest contribution, um, I, don't, I wish I had one that I could point at, say like Tom Boshart last year, uh, Pointed and obviously been honored for his uh, tremendous work on behavior genetics and his twin studies. I, I want to come back to that a little bit later and say that I wish I had a single thing like that. I don't. I think, though, that I was really instrumental in the work uh, I did with Cliff Luneborg years ago on uh, the information processing correlates of verbal ability. Uh, I think that that set a tone. In, in addition to being useful in itself, it set a tone, and many other people went into many other studies in the same spirit to start looking at individual differences there. And I think the fact that I had at least some reputation in experimental psychology, and then I was doing this, made it okay for a lot of experimental psychologists to start studying these things. And the result, we've got this explosion of work, say, on working memory, mm -hmm. tremendous work on models of spatial uh, orientation and it's basically information processing models to very strong individual differences aspects and that's been very successful and I'm really very proud of that a second thing I'm proud of uh, is uh, that more recent work that we have done with my colleagues in the, in the last 15 years on the workforce on getting looking how, at how information processing capacities and knowledge is used in, in actual settings in the workforce. Uh, that has led us into looking at instrumentation. It's led us to looking at individual differences. For example, the fact that working memory uh, measures are much better than the Raven matrix measure for, uh, a for understanding the um, performance of uh, dispatchers. Uh, and there are dispatchers in lots of tasks. Uh, we, we study public safety dispatchers. And there are 9-11 mm -hmm. people and problem solving there. Uh, we're very happy with that. Uh, more recently, we've been looking at uh, the extent to which uh, higher, I don't want to say high with you sitting here studying the very talented, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, above average to uh, maybe the other end of average, uh, students in um, science courses and the extent to which the better students do consistent thinking regardless whether it's right or wrong, the extent to which they see a need for connecting the dots from one problem to another. Right. And I think that is going beyond, that's what I mean by going beyond trying to understand the variance in the intelligence test to trying to understand the variation in human performance right out in the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite happy about that. Well, so are we. Uh, what is your greatest professional regret? What is my greatest professional regret? Well, can I take two and a half? Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, I assume you don't mean the fact that I had a chance to go to law school while I was at Yale. I had a chance to transfer to Yale Law School. I didn't take it, and I met, you know how much money those people make? <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I blew that one. <laughs> now, more profession. Uh, I, um, when we started our work on high verbal, we also did some work on high math right at the start. If you look at our very first publication, there's equal uh, time given to high verbal and high math groups. And we found there was this a short-term memory, and, and memory for short periods of time, what we now call working memory ideas in the high math. And then we also found this access to long-term memory in the high verbal. And I said, well, we've got to bet on one of these horses and put our energies in it. So we bet on the wrong one. 
there would have been more, I think there would have been more uh, push in the 70s. I wish we had gone back and done more work with the high math and the uh, uh, working memory. Mm -hmm. But we didn't. Mm -hmm. Now, my second regret, aside from the fact that the publishers, the half is the publisher did a lousy job of selling my books, I've got a couple of three good books with lousy sales, mm -hmm. <laughs> was uh, that uh, is more diffuse, and I think there might be a message for anybody who doesn't yet have, anybody who is not so entrenched at their institution that they're stuck there. When Tom Boshart um, last year talked, he talked about the support and how important it had been for him to get a long-term project, to by, be, and he was only able to do so because of the support he had at his university mm -hmm. and because of the number of colleagues that he yeah. had at the university that would work with him. Mm -hmm. I was never able to have that. I was just jealous as I listened to him. Uh, I've never been able to have that. I've had graduate students and postdocs. People I support have been great. But I worked at an institution that encouraged a star system, was very concerned with who was PI on everything, and uh, basically made it very difficult to, uh, uh, to get together a team of colleagues. So I did what I did mm -hmm. with postdocs and graduate students, and they've been great. Uh, I had chances to leave, but for personal reasons, I didn't. Mm -hmm. So on the whole, I don't know where I come down. Uh, I guess I'd just say that as you slide down the banister of life, some of the splinters are not pointing in the right direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, uh, so on the whole, it was okay, but that was a professional regret. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage anybody taking that career to look very carefully at what your institution will do for you when you don't have a grant, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And I would urge people to look for examples because the administrator who is interviewing you will take a talk, a great talk, but his money and his mouth may not be co-located. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Good point. Well, Buzz, let's talk about one of your books. So ten years ago, uh, it's the 10-year anniversary of Will We Be Smart Enough? You won an APA Book Award mm -hmm. from Division I, William James. Um, I was at your talk. I enjoyed it. Um, is the message still the same in this day and age? Uh, a lot has happened in the last 10 years. Uh, the world's flat now. Yeah. Um, and uh, in with the talk about leave no child behind? What, what do you, what, what's your position today? Well, uh, first let me get some references. I think for the audience, The uh, World is Flat was a remark title of Tom Friedman's book, uh, columnist, where he points out that we are in a competitive market today, uh, that because of advances in technology, goods and services can be delivered, do not have to be delivered do not have to be created, many goods and services do not have to be created at the place where they are received. Uh, if you don't believe me, reserve your hotel in, uh, in Albuquerque through India, through, through the call receiver mm -hmm. in India. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, the, uh, as a result, we are competing worldwide with a much larger group of people. Friedman has a wonderful line, he says, are you one in a million? Take your group of people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right? You have a student here who can say he's, or one of your subjects who say can he one in a million. China has 1,400 people like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Think it over. We're in a, uh, a, a much tougher um, uh, league. Now, also, the, the cognitive demands have, of just getting around in the world have gotten better. Uh, you're seeing personal bankruptcies at an all-time high. People don't know how to manage credit, and uh, uh, that's a pretty cognitive task. Uh, the differential in income inequality is large because low-skill jobs are going away. Now, on the good side, we know that something can be done because of the cohort effect that Flynn talks so much about, uh, and rightly so, uh, that uh, Flynn's observations and Shai's before him uh, show that there is something in the society that indeed can improve cognitive competence. Uh, students today uh, 
really do know more mm -hmm. than they used to. So that's, that's the good news. But most of that effect has been at the bottom. We have brought the bottom up so that we are less likely to have a large group of people who are a drag on the society. And I've got to give credit to the, uh, to, to the Bush administration and the No Child Left Behind Act that the introduction of negative feedback mechanisms into the educational system so that they have to monitor their own performance is probably a very good thing, and it will have that effect. It makes the school system realize that there are real and immediate consequences for uh, leaving people behind. Problem is that we have lost the reward structure for the people to get ahead. Or not, not so much the reward structure as we have lost the nurturance for people to get ahead. Uh, that the drivers at the top are not receiving the opportunities and the support that they need. And I think it is not, I think this is particularly a concern uh, in some of uh, our current underprivileged groups that we're not good enough at identifying the talent in, that, in those groups. Uh, the, uh, and identifying the social motivation, the whole set that will get people more confident at the top. And I think that is going to, could really rebound on our society. Because there are other societies who are quite ready to push the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what do you do with that in, in terms of when you do push the top? Because our society really does reward handsomely bright people who are very energetic. And how, how do you bring everyone along with such profound individual differences in abilities and, and energy levels? And okay. Well, what I was saying by push the top is getting more people so they can get into it. Mm -hmm. All right. And getting more people performing at a very high level. Uh, I think your, your um, horse more is... Uh, what do we do about uh, keeping everybody up? And one of the problems uh, I think we have in, in our society is uh, that if you rely solely on the market, okay, this is now looking at the will we be smart enough mm -hmm. for everybody to start. If you rely solely on the market a place and on economic rewards, that's a very good short-term mechanism. That generates a lot of um, push at the short term. It generates a lot of energy, so forth. It is not, the market does not have a good long-term planning record. It does not, it, it, it market is not, is almost by definition not good at delaying rewards. So that, so long as we push and make a prestige for our most talented people to be the economic now, everybody won't go there, obviously, mm -hmm. one way and the other. There are people who will always want to be uh, you know, even professors. <laughs> but uh, that to the extent that we keep emphasizing the sort of short-term rewards and that the social status and everything is done on the short-term reward, we are going to discourage the top from looking at the long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think we need more of a sense of community. I think that academics, who are themselves the ultimate individualists, devalue the sense of community and the importance of identification with the institution. Uh, that, uh, God, I've, I have, over my career, uh, done a lot of consulting and work with the military, mm -hmm. the Department of Defense, and I've been impressed by how much more they get out of both high-talent and low-talent people because those people have a feeling of a sense of community and a sense of all, everybody works together to get something done rather than individualism. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I'm not holding up the military for a minute as a model for society, but I'm saying there's some aspects of the sort of sense and pride of, of being in a community that academics undervalue. And that would go a long way toward getting both the, the top up and, and bringing the bottom along. Then the top ought to maybe do more work on instrumentation and uh, 
we do that we do this now a variety of things to make the larger group more productive rather than shipping something offshore <laughs> I see what it's so hard with this could, this could, could I yeah go I, ahead I just had a thought I like Nam yeah let me give an exact instruction about the marketplace and so Suppose you had the choice. Suppose you're, you're operating something that requires the development of services and such, and you had a choice between investing in a long-term, in a, in a combination of training programs and better instrumentation so that a uh, group of maybe not top people could perform a higher level, uh, who were not in some sense, could not perform, or you could train them up. You invest in better training programs, which can do a lot, mm -hmm. or you can ship this offshore to, to some country with a very large population and you only want, say, only you ask China, say, you've got 1,400 of the people I want. I only want two of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, in the short term, it may be better to ship it offshore for your, your profit margin. But in the long term, it's better for all of us if you go to the improvement of the, uh, the general improvement of our own workforce. And I worry a little bit that the short-term trends are dominating. Mm -hmm. How how do you see this playing out in in the academy um, when you when you talk about defining community? Um, it's it's a very abstract concept. I'm with the exception of one colleague at my university. I'm in contact with a lot of people in this room more than my other colleagues. Mm -hmm. I how do you define community? Well, I think there is a sense of feeling. I once. Um, and I think that a lot of uh, professorial types, for instance, are really very good with my students. Uh, I and and you you put yourself in yeah. the role. Uh, pronoun structure of the English language mm -hmm. is hurting me here. <laughs> but you're all set. That I think every one of my colleagues, for example, I've ever met and colleagues I've are probably very good. Think I'm really good with my students, and they're probably right. But they may not be so hot with our students with the students in the department as a whole, with the concern, certainly at the undergraduate level. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got to wind up taking pride in that. Now, again, so long as the reward structure is tied tightly to how many grants you've got, how big your grant is, and such, you're, you're discouraging sense of community. Mm -hmm. Now, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to do because I am for individual uh, free enterprise and such, but I would think we could also maybe ameliorate that with a sense of community and it would be that we'd be all be better off okay so uh, so what's your advice to graduate students in this day and age oh well uh, remember my remark about uh, the uh, splinters and the banister live with it it's gonna happen <laughs> uh, well the first thing I would say is uh, don't that uh, you're probably pretty bright if you're a graduate student, and there's really something to the G theory. So don't get super specialized. Don't, in, in, in one sense, you're going to have to specialize. But develop some skills. If you specialize, make sure that it's in something that is of interest, not just to your advisor and the two labs where they're debating that topic, that something that is a real interest. Now here I think that what I've said about the trends that we're seeing a solidification and reduction in theories is going to make it easier to identify what those key issues are. And we're going to work on one of those. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that I think is being most ignored, that's me, that biology is going to be hot, is the issue of uh, how intelligence is used. Uh, but that's me. The second thing is, uh, that you really do have to decide for yourself, uh, especially as long as we remain as hyper-competitive as, uh, as we have been, uh, where your professional and personal life uh, ends. And that's a decision you've got to make for yourself, but mm -hmm. I would urge you not to wander into it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the um, other thing is maybe trying is remember, if you don't like it, don't get hung up on the tenure rate. There are tremendous opportunities, some of the best opportunities for research and some of the best research I know on individual differences in personality and intelligence being done by the uh, 
uh, by some of the large companies, including some that you've never heard of. The I.O. psychologists? Uh, no, I wasn't thinking of them, actually. I was thinking of uh, another company that's even more hidden, but uh, tests 40,000 people a day. Eat your heart out, ETS. <laughs> they do it over the Internet, the mm -hmm. IOs. Uh, that, uh, so if you're a, um, you know, if you get hung up and you don't like the way things are going and you're PhD, fine. You've shown you can make it. Now, uh, making it doesn't necessarily mean get tenure or necessarily uh, keeping tenure. The two brightest people, the, well, two of the brightest people I know just got off the tenure track. Well, and got off them. One of them is doing, uh, many of my graduate students, I should say, are in industry. And one of them is doing tremendous work in the aviation industry on, ap on applying intelligence and uh, artificial intelligence and uh, mating human and, and computer intelligence in, in the aviation industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the other one simply chucked the whole thing and is in business. And they're both doing quite nicely. Graduate students should remember that. A PhD is not a statement, is not a vow of poverty for life. <laughs> uh, it's certainly not a vow of humility. And I think I'll stop at this moment. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, but why don't we open it up to questions from the audience? Yes. Okay, the question is, what implications and conclusions can you draw from ability tilts in different countries, verbal over quant, quant over verbal? Right. Okay, it appears that for whatever reason, and this is not clear, uh, for whatever reason, some countries are turning out 15-year-olds who are more, uh, who are relatively more competent in mathematics than verbal and others in verbal than math. Uh, we don't know what the overall implications of that are going to be. I think that uh, it's going to take careful study for a number of years to find out. Uh, the tentative work right now is that the technological drivers are the mathematical, and that narrow technological uh, view. You can make jokes about a nation of engineers over here and a nation of attorneys over here, and they both need each other because there's a thing called patent law. But uh, that we really don't know what the effects of that are going to be. And I think it's going to be one of the most interesting questions in sort of workforce intelligence over the next few years. Other questions? Doug. I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the question is, why does Buzz put so much effort into his reviews of manuscripts? Well, I think there are some people, possibly here in this audience, who wish that I were a little more tired at times. <laughs> but um, this takes your view of the reviewing process. I was asked that once, and a colleague of mine said, you know, you can say why something shouldn't be published in 500 words. And that's probably true. Uh, if you regard your role as a gatekeeper, uh, if you regard your role, and you other things that you, well, the, he said, well, then the education role. And I thought, no, that's not the education role. It seemed to me that the role of the reviewer and the editor is to get good science published, not not to get hyper about getting bad science out, because virtually every paper, virtually, not literally. Virtually every paper was submitted by smart people who 
who had reasonable ideas and did something reasonably. And the important thing for the reviewer and the editor is to do as much as they can to get the best science out and put the best face on that paper because that's how we advance and that's what motivates me. Uh, that's got to be a, that's got to not be a workplace motivator because uh, I, I know that that doesn't help my market share at all. <laughs> Other questions? Tom. There's a contrary view. I, I, I was the editor of the Peterson Journal for quite a while. Pay more attention to things, and I've never been able to resolve that. I, I think it's a real puzzle. Neither have I. Uh, I once calculated when I was editor of the J, uh, Journal of Experimental Psychology General. I calculated uh, the, the approximate manpower or person power in hours, the number of hours people were spending reviewing, and I came out. I had a figure. It came out that it was approximately equal to the total uh, hours productivity for a year of uh, a major psychology department. So sort of with my tongue, in my tongue firmly in my cheek, I suggested that maybe we should share this on an annual basis, that one year we would just take UCLA offline and it would do <laughs> nothing but review. And then next year would be Minnesota's turn and then Washington, <laughs> then Vanderbilt. We could just go around and do that. Uh, that would um, be much more efficient, save postage. Uh, that uh, I think we have, in some sense, too much publication and uh, not enough trying to get really good seminal papers. Uh, to get and you know, and that that the pressure to publish. The there are a lot of reasons for that. One is there's a lot of us. The other is that. Uh, the social thing is that it's now possible to get count so that uh, y looking good on the computer of your superior, of, of whoever's promoting you, is gotten to be relevantly more, more, relatively more important than it used to be. Uh, I don't know how to beat it. I agree with you. I, I agree with everything you say, and it's just as good and bad to everything. Other questions? Tom. I, it, it's kind of like, I, I think I'm just getting older now. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most important thing you have. Okay. How do you allocate your time? How do you decide what you're going to read and what you're not going to read? And how are you going to compare? I think that's a useful thing. If, if one has a good algorithm, it's a useful thing to pass on to graduate. The well, question is, how does Buzz allocate his time? Well, first I look at my tennis schedule. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, that I think you get an article, you get interesting articles uh, that um, I think it's very inefficient. There are certain journals that I read and that I scan regularly. Uh, more and more you go to meetings, you go to the small meetings and find out who's doing what and then you start looking at that person's work and then you start looking at the citations that that person gives and that, that sort of gives you a web of things to do. Uh, I don't make a great deal of use of the computer searches uh, at the start. I will when I've got a specific topic in focus. Um, a number of years ago, Ross Quinlan and I proposed a reactive library. Uh, and the idea of the reactive library was that it would actually keep track of things and do very much what Google and what Amazon does now, 
that for scientists, it would rec it would, given what you were looking through through the electronic journal, it would alert you when something relevant uh, ha has happened. I am surprised that hasn't yet been developed. I think it could be quite useful. That was in your JE, JEP general editorial, wasn't it? Uh, your closing statement. Yeah, that was in the that was in the closing statement on the JEP general editorial. Yeah, but. Uh, Ross Quinlan and I did that work about 1970, about 1973. We published the reactive library paper. Doug, how are we doing? Um, more okay. Um, other questions? What type of wine are they serving there? That's a good <laughs> question. Let's go find that out. I think we need an empirical investigation. <laughs>